Well, people are continuing to, uh, to stream in, uh, but let me go ahead and uh, begin. Uh, I'm Robert George. I'm the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program at American Ideals and uh, Institutions. And I have the honor to be uh, your host today here in my personal individual uh, capacity. Your host today for this Fidelity Month launch webinar. Uh, Fidelity Month is a, is a month and a movement that is dedicated to rededicating ourselves to the fundamental values that have historically been for us Americans in this pluralistic society, our main sources of unity and strength. Countries and cultures have to have sources of unity. They have to have sources of strength. For some countries and cultures, the sources of unity are thrown in an altar or blood and soil. But that's not us, that's not America. We come from many different cultures, many different races, ethnicities, religions, historical experiences. But what unites us, in addition to fidelity to our great constitutional principles, are our shared commitments, or have been our shared commitments to fundamental values such as faith in God, such as fidelity in marriage and in the family, such as our sense of patriotism and duty to our country and to our communities. But all of the survey data today shows, and I think our own personal experience confirms this, that those values have eroded, our sense of the importance of those values as a people has eroded in our country. And that's dangerous. We've got to do something to turn that around. And so one of the many, many, many things that we should do, I think, is to devote some special time to rededicating ourselves to those core values. And that's what Fidelity Month is all about. Our vision is a positive vision. It's rooted in our sense of the goodness of fidelity to God, fidelity in marriage and to the family, fidelity to our country and our community. And to talk about the importance of those values and what we can do to restore them in our own lives and in our culture and nation, uh, I've got the intellectual equivalent of the 1927 Yankees. Any of you who know anything about baseball history know that the 27 Yankees were perhaps the greatest baseball team in history. And that starting lineup of hitters was formidable, especially the first seven. And we've got the intellectual match for that uh, today. I'll uh, introduce them uh, here all uh, together, but very briefly, I could spend so much time on the achievements of each of them, but I'll just introduce them very uh, briefly, and then uh, I will um, recognize them in the order in which I've introduced them. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Jacqueline Rivers. She's the Executive Director and Senior Fellow for Policy and research at the Seymour Institute for Black Church and Policy Studies. Andrew Walker, PhD, is professor of theology at the Southern Baptist Theological uh, Seminary, where he teaches in the, in the area of ethics. Lila Rose is a pro-life uh, activist and founder of Live Action. Anna Samuel is uh, co-founder of the uh, Canavox marriage movement, and I'm proud to say is my former student. I've, I've reversed the order there. Anna will actually go before Lila. Uh, Bill McClay, Dr. Wilfred McClay, is the Victor Davis Hanson Professor of Classical History and Western Civilization at Hillsdale College. James Matthew Wilson is the Cullen Family Chair in English Literature. Uh, and the director and founder of the program in creative uh, writing at the University of St. Thomas. He is also a poet. And then batting cleanup for our 27 Yankees uh, is Yuval Levin, Dr. Yuval Levin, who is director of social, cultural, and constitutional studies at the American Enterprise Institute. So again, welcome to everybody who's joined, the hundreds of you, this is so great. And welcome to our panel. And I now uh, turn things over to our first speaker, Dr. Jacqueline Rivers. Thank you so much, Robbie. It is a great honor to be here, and it is indeed encouraging to see the movement that is being launched with Fidelity Month. And I'm honored to be able to talk a little bit about the importance of fidelity to God, which is really essential to the peace, harmony, well-being of our nation. 
Proverbs 14, 34 says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. And indeed, it is the morality of a population which makes for stability and social harmony in the nation. Thomas Farr recognized, uh, talks about how the founders of the United States recognize that, how they recognize that laws in and of themselves didn't guarantee harmony and peace, no matter how good and just those laws would be. The founders recognized that the very structure of government, the brilliant division of powers into three branches of government by itself didn't guarantee stability, peace, and harmony because all of it depended on a population that was ready to comply with the laws. The morality of the people was far more important, was just as important as the structures in which they would be implemented. And enforcement couldn't be seen as an alternative to this kind of morality in the population. In any society in which there is widespread disregard for the laws, it would take draconian levels of enforcement in an attempt to rectify the situation. And all of this starts with the individual, with the allegiance to God that each individual is called to make. It is the conduct and conscience of individuals which shapes the nation. And moreover, this commitment to God can serve as a check on an allegiance to, a, to the government when it is necessary. And perhaps the most powerful example is a negative one. The German population that embraced and cooperated with the Third Reich played an important role. That portion of the population, that majority of the population played an important role in the Holocaust and in the rise of World War II. And many of those who defied the oppression of the Jews really did so out of a sense of moral conviction and out of their allegiance to a higher power, to God himself. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a very obvious example. As a Lutheran minister, he cooperated with others to plot Adolf Hitler's assassination in order to end the scourge of Nazism on Europe and the world. Corrie Ten Boom and her family were all Christians and they joined others risking their lives and their freedom to protect Jews in Germany. In fact, they ended up spending, being interned, she and her sister in a Nazi concentration camp for their courageous defense of their Jewish neighbors. And indeed this principle was at work among enslaved people in the American South. Fidelity to God, to a power higher than their human masters protected slave sense of dignity as human beings. And it reinforced their faith and that very commitment to God because they knew that ultimately he would judge those who attempted to reduce them to mere chattel. This is really powerfully documented in the work of Albert Rabato, his book, Slave Religion, and in Eugene Genovese's masterpiece, Roll, Jordan, Roll. And I'm happy to say this principle is still at work in the 20th century. Fidelity to God gave courage to the black church, to ministers of the black church during the civil rights movement to fight against unjust, degrading laws that mandated racial segregation, that justified apartheid and terror in the American South, and that robbed blacks of the right to vote. These were laws that were themselves in violation of God's own laws. And the civil rights leaders had the, right, had the courage to stand up and defy those laws. Today, fidelity to God enables the black church to resist racial injustice, even when it's enacted by law enforcement officers as it was during the murder of George Floyd. Today, fidelity to God enables the black church to stand up for the rights, the right to the ministerial exception, the right of churches to hire only those who share our religious beliefs as ministers. Today, fidelity to God enables the black church to preach and teach the biblical truth on human gender and anthropology and on marriage and family, despite the legalization of homosexual unions. The decline in the infidelity to God, the decline in Christianity that has swept Europe and is on the rise in the US has happily had limited effects so far 
But really it's because the mores, values and institutions that arose out of a broad, if sometimes shallow embrace of the Judeo-Christian tradition have survived the decline in belief. But what awaits us when under the weight of post-material values, these structures collapse? Already we're witnessing growing discord as widespread agreement about values begins to decline. And this has moved some fierce defenders of secularity, such as the philosopher Jürgen Habermas, to advocate for post-secularism, -secular, for the reintroduction of religious discussion into the public square. According to historian Brad S. Gregory of the University of Notre Dame, no new philosophical system has emerged to provide a moral foundation that is widely accepted in the place of Christianity. And this lack of societal agreement, agreement continues to undermine our most important formal institutions. Our fidelity to God is essential to the well being of the whole nation. Thank you, Dr. Rivers. That was so powerful. And now let me recognize uh, Professor Andrew Walker. Great. Thank you so much to uh, Professor George for the invitation to participate in this. And I'll be following Dr. Rivers on offering comments about fidelity to God. And I want to begin by referencing uh, a famous quote that many of us are no doubt familiar with from Augustine, who said that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. And though this statement is an indicative statement of truth, it also assumes a very important imperative that we are meant to be in communion with God, that we're not just homo sapiens, but we're also homo religiosus, and that to know God is to be human at its fullest, that we're to commune with God, not just be, uh, for, to seek our own supremacy, but because communing with God is what brings peace and right order to the soul. And so to, to follow kind of uh, Augustine again, he, he talks about the ordo omoris or the order of loves. Uh, and as we think about fidelity month and fidelity to the goods of family, community, and nation, we recognize these as, as goods and ends to be pursued for their own sake. But the love that they're given um, is proportionate to the love that they are owed. Um, and so for us to love these things rightly, we should love God, firstly, because we owe God our highest affections, because uh, it is he who made us. We, we are not our own, Psalm 103 says. And as we come to know God and conform ourselves to his divine plan, uh, we believe that the, the fullness of our being, the fullness of our personality comes into view, that knowing God allows us to know everything else as everything else is to rightly be known. Um, Psalm 36, 9 is one of my favorite verses, and it, it says, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. So it's in knowing God rightly that we can rightly know other things as these other things are to be known. So I think we need to, to recommit to God um, also for the, the sake of our identity and a true knowledge of the self. Um, we live in an age right now where endless identities are on offer, um, and it's the knowledge of God that gives a rightful and definitive knowledge of the self, thus providing that very thing that our society cannot provide a fixed anchor point for, which is our identity. And Christian theology has provided a rich tradition of interacting uh, as far as understanding the relationship between epistemology and anthropology, which fuse together those two questions are asking, how do we know who we are? And theologians have argued that philosophy on its own is insufficient to the task to answer that question, that we actually need theology for this. And, and someone like John Calvin in his Institutes, he offers these very famous opening lines. He says, nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say, true and sound wisdom consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. And so Calvin is restating 
this architectonic truth that God is the font of all meaningful knowledge and that apart from him, uh, we, we are prone to wander around in the darkness. And, and indeed, we do wander around in the darkness and that we cannot explain the obligations that beset us um, apart from having God as the source of those obligations. And that brings me to my next point is that we need to recommit to God for the sake of moral order. And here I'm thinking about the, the, the famous kind of dichotomy that uh, the economist Thomas Sowell has offered, these two visions of the universe, one being a constrained vision of the universe versus an unconstrained vision of the universe. Uh, a constrained vision is one where there is moral order that's bounded by truth, order, and, and obligation. And this unconstrained alternative is one where there's kind of endless plasticity, wandering, and subjectivity. And so within a biblical cosmology, uh, we, we have the vocabulary and the framework to understand that these longings, these moral longings that, that are implanted within us, um, th they are all intelligible. So desires for friendship, for knowledge, for beauty, for intimacy, for family, um, pursued rightly, uh, these are all coming into full color in knowing God. That to know God means that we are going to order our lives under his reign and rule. That in, in the Christian accounting of the human person, it's liberty under law, not liberty above law, that is where human flourishing is truly found. And um, you go to a verse like Psalm 119.45, and it says, I will walk at liberty. For I seek thy precepts. And, and here the psalmist is tying flourishing to a sense of limitation and obligation grounded ultimately in friendship with God. And the last thing I'll say is this, is that God gives us the good. So that as we begin this inaugural Fidelity Month, um, we ought to recommit ourselves and rededicate ourselves to God. That, that we ought to be able to say to each other, to our loved ones, to our community, that you were made to know God, that God is the ultimate source of our happiness, and that to know God is not a rejection of the creaturely good, but rather to know God is to allow us to know the creaturely good from the beginning, as both Matthew talks about in Genesis chapter 1 as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Walker. Uh, those comments from uh, Professor Walker and uh, Prof uh, Dr. Rivers uh, bring to mind uh, some things that I've been thinking about myself, especially in my um, role as a teacher of constitutional law in the American founding. Um, first is our national motto. Our national motto is in God we trust. We place our trust in God. And we don't, we don't trust in hum, merely human powers. We don't trust in the forces of history. We don't believe that history has sides or history renders judgment. It's God who renders judgment, and it's in God we trust. And you'll remember that at Gettysburg, Lincoln, praying for a new birth of freedom, trying to bring a kind of renewal, the same kind of renewal we are trying to bring with Fidelity Month, Lincoln referred to this nation under God. He prayed that this nation under God will have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people by the people and for the people will not perish from the earth. And then there are those statements by two great American founders, one John Adams, who in speaking of the constitution that had been proposed, he said that our constitution is for a moral and religious people and simply will not do well for any other kind of people. This goes back to Dr. Rivers' point that the best constitution, the best laws in the world still won't do the job if the people's hearts are not in the right place, if people's virtue has been lost. And then finally, Jefferson's um, famous statement. And remember Jefferson was, though not an atheist, probably the most secular of the founders. He was also a slaveholder, notoriously a slaveholder. But he knew that slavery was wrong, and he knew that it was wrong because it was contrary to the will and to the law of God. And so speaking of slavery, Jefferson himself said, I tremble for my country 
when I consider that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. Jefferson's message there is that we are a people, as Lincoln would eventually say later, say, under God. That means a people under judgment. We are called to greatness, but we are under judgment. We are not judges of ourselves. We don't get to decide whether we've done well or badly. It's not by our own lights, but by a higher law. Dr. Samuel. All right. Well, thank you, Robbie, for bringing us together for this Reaches Project. It's my special honor today to say a few words about fidelity to marriage and family. So over the past several decades, our civilization has experimented with a number of alternatives to faithful marriage. We've been hounded with messages that non-marital sex, easy no-fault divorce, cohabitation, and same-sex partnerships are all acceptable, and that we should lighten up on the commitment to faithful marriage as the one and only ideal. Today, we hear new voices calling for society to loosen further, to consider polyamory and open marriages too. Some academics are even calling for society to do away with mononormativity, which like heteronormativity is used as a term of disparagement, in this case, towards the monogamous ideal. These various and sundry, mostly cranky voices even claim that it's discriminatory to put monogamy up on a pedestal over and above all other romantic relationships. So it's worth pausing to ask, do they have a point? Should we be personally investing in faithful marriages and publicly praising our long lived couples? So allow me to offer you a very brief summary of the ways in which our faithful marriages between one man and one woman confer tremendous benefits to society at large, making it a superior choice over other sexual relationships and family forms. First, faithful marriages greatly benefit children. About 25% of the US population is children. And this sizable portion of our society is also the most vulnerable, dependent on us adults for their well-being. The social science data here is strong. Faithful, one man, one woman marriages provide these benefits to kids. A more stable home for kids because the mother and father have committed to lifelong union. And this increases the probability that the child will have a lifelong stable parenting structure. A safer home by virtually eliminating the number one risk of child abuse, an unrelated adult male in the home. Faithful married couples are statistically more likely to ensure their children's safety. Higher quality parenting due to gender balanced care. Mothers can count on the father's help and fathers can count on mother's help. As both sexes pour their unique talents into the parenting enterprise, a great synergy of their strengths gives children the best start in life. An anchor for the child's identity satisfying that deep human desire to know and be loved by one's biological parents and ancestors. Better educational outcomes as kids from faithful marriages are statistically more likely to achieve higher grades and degrees, which are correlated with higher earnings later in life. And finally, increased financial resources. Faithfully married couples pool their resources together and they don't spend on outside romantic partners. They're more likely to save and make long-term investments, which trickles down to the benefit of kids who can partake of those family-owned assets and inheritances. Other vulnerable segments of our society include the poor and working class men. Marriage benefits them in several ways. First, consider the success sequence. 97% of millennials who follow the success sequence, that is, they graduate from high school, get a full-time job once their education is completed, and marry before having children, avoid a life of poverty. The power of this sequence, which includes monogamous marriage, can catapult so many vulnerable individuals upward. Marriage is also associated with better physical health for men, as well as better mental health outcomes. Faithfully married men who are married to a woman are less likely to report depression, and they experience higher levels of happiness. Likewise, men are better off financially when they are faithfully married and helping to provide for a family. Thirdly, marriages, faithful marriages generate an ethos of unity. 
whereas modern progressive partnerships cultivate an ethos of division. The commitment to unity is baked right into the definition of what marriage is. According to natural law, marriage is a union of one man and one woman, open to begetting children, permanent or lifelong, and exclusive or monogamous. This ideal of marriage creates long lasting relational bonds. Togetherness is the priority. By contrast, the progressive view gives primacy to the self, to each individual's self-actualization through subjective feelings. So marriage has to be redefined. In this case, biological sex doesn't marry, matter. It's not necessarily open to children. It will last for whatever length of time the partners want, and it will include whatever number of sexual partners. It's not necessarily exclusive. This means that when an individual's desires come into conflict with others in the partnership, the self will be prioritized. It's going to lead to more disagreements that end in standoffs and exits rather than in unity. All the benefits of faithful monogamous marriage ripple out to benefit society as a whole. They yield more unified and stable families that strengthen our social fabric. And by contrast, on the right of this graphic, you see how all the instability and brokenness and infidelity of non-monogamous unions pull and tear our communities apart, increasing relational anarchy and human harm, especially towards the most vulnerable, children and the poor. Now, let me just end on a compassionate note and acknowledge that in our wounded world, brokenness is often inevitable. Life happens, and often we can't live up to the ideal, no matter how hard we might try. With compassionate mercy, we can and we should avoid painful judgments on particular people in particular situations. At the same time, we cannot sacrifice fidelity to the marriage ideal, which is the source of human healing and flourishing. Only when we acknowledge an ideal for what it is, a gold standard by which all other options are calibrated, can we work to shore up less than ideal situations so they can become the best versions of themselves possible. So to those in intact, stable marriages and families, I say we bear a very special responsibility here to reach out to those who are wounded, to share our relationship riches, and to offer apprenticeships in healthy family formation so as to promote social healing writ large. Because the bottom line is that our society is more likely to flourish when faithful, monogamous, natural law marriages are plentiful and the norm. So to all the modern marriage heroes out there, those of you facing challenging situations and doing all you can to put the needs of your spouses and children before your own self-centered desires, we salute you. Thank you for your national service. You are walking the path of fidelity, which leads to a brighter future for you, your spouses, your family, and the entire nation. Thank you so much, Dr. Samuel. And let me um, uh, say to folks who are who are zooming in to be with us in our in our audience, if you're not familiar with Canavox, uh, the marriage movement that Dr. Samuel co-founded, please um, look them up. Go to Google uh, Canavox, C-A-N-A-V-O-X, uh, and have a look and see if you want to get involved in rebuilding the marriage culture. Uh, and now I'm uh, happy to recognize uh, Ms. Rose, Lila. You need to unmute. There thank we you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor George. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. It was a wonderful presentation, and it's an honor to join all of you. We are facing the, the cost of the sexual revolution today in the disharmony, in the trauma, in the woundedness at large in our culture. And it is a great opportunity for us to help people see the correct vision of what we're made for as human beings and the opportunity to before us to reclaim love and in this beautiful month to now reclaim the, the concept of fidelity. St. Clair of Assisi says that we become what we love and who we love shapes what we become. And 
when we live in a society where we've lost sense of what love is and love doesn't involve commitment, it doesn't involve sacrifice, it's about feeling, it's about in many ways our trauma or just our desire, our momentary desires, we ultimately lose ourselves and we lose who we are created to be. But if we are a people that is giving and thriving, we are also committing and we get married and we are faithful and this is how our society can be strong. So we've often heard it said marriage is the, the building block of any functioning society. And it's no surprise that the divorce rate today, that the increase in anxiety and depression, our mental health crises today, our, the brokenness of our families today, all of these things are connected. Many have heard of the very famous um, longest study, ongoing study uh, to look at human happiness, which is the Harvard happiness study. And the, the top qualifier for best outcomes in the Harvard happiness study, which followed cohorts of men. And when you remove the differences of education and their socioeconomic backgrounds, we found the study found that men who were married had the best outcomes for their health, for their wellness, for their economic opportunities, that marriage was the deciding factor. And this is also borne out in many, uh, many other social studies. This has been uh, studied at large, but you don't hear this often. You know, I, I work in a space of uh, many young people, millennials and Gen Zers, who have no clue that their futures are being shaped by the decisions that they make when they are young and that the messages that they receive from our society at large to choose against sex, sex in marriage, to choose before sex, before marriage, to choose against lifelong commitment, to choose against having children in a marriage, to choose against these things actually opens the door to disharmony and unhappiness for them lifelong. So the opportunity before us is to speak the truth in a culture of confusion and not only to speak the truth about the better outcomes for those that have sex within marriage, for the better outcomes of those who stay married, for the better outcomes of those who have welcomed children into the world within a marriage, but to also witness that in the models and how we live our own lives. I think the best way that we can reclaim the month of June and spread the, the value, the virtue of fidelity is by living it and by sh sharing what we're living. I re recently lost lost my grandmother uh, we uh, uh, many of us but she she married what stayed married to my grandfather for 70 years looking at her example I know my parents and my grandfather's example were inspired they just mar were married now 40 years I'm married now all of four years but my marriage is built on the inspiration in many ways of those that went before me and so if we can celebrate those are married and share their stories, if we can build strong marriages by encouraging married couples and supporting in our parishes, in our communities, um, in, our, in our workplaces by supporting marriage and, and celebrating it as, as the building block of our society, and then speak truth to help young people especially understand that, that they hope for cannot be had by living the lifestyles of the sexual revolution, that it cannot be had through contraceptive ideology by saying sex outside of marriage, sex separate from marriage, sex separate from children is somehow a right and a, and a joy when it really brings unhappiness, that divorce um, is, is, uh, is a good thing or that we shouldn't even bother getting married because marriage is just a piece of paper, that we are not, uh, our gender identity is not rooted in our biology, but it's some construct, social construct. But if we can speak the truth to these lies that young people have been Uh, Lila seems I, frozen. Lila, you froze up on a us. New opportunity. Uh, I knew these all wild and outside. Can you hear me now? Yes. Am I still frozen? So can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll close out with this. Um, we 
all know the death toll from abortion, 2,500 children killed every day by abortion. And if we recognize that, that as we're fighting for marriage, we're fighting for them, we're fighting for these children, I think it's a, a further inspiration for us to take this battle seriously in the court of public opinion and educating other young people that, yes, we want to build strong marriages, but we need to inspire people about what sex is for and what marriage is for, because that ultimately is going to help save the lives that are being lost every day. The, the, the abortion rate for unmarried women, 86% of women who have abortions are unmarried. And so the, the solution to the abortion crisis is a reclaiming of the value of marriage and an education on the beauty of marriage, as well as modeling marriage for the world and helping people see it's good. Thanks for hosting this, uh, Dr. George. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Lila. Uh, your, your remarks and those of Dr. Uh, Samuel uh, bring to my mind that one of the great half-truths that, uh, that people believe is that marriage is a purely private matter. Now that is half true. Uh, marriage is a private relationship. The, 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 you're not married to the government, you're married to another private uh, individual. But another sense, uh, in another sense, in a more profound sense, marriage is also a very public uh, institution. It's uh, the consequences of a healthy marriage uh, culture for society are great. The consequences of an unhealthy uh, marriage society, a marriage culture are tragic for any culture. And of course, children suffer most when things go badly um, in, the, in the marriage culture. The other sense in which it's not really strictly a private um, institution is that we all rely on our marriages on other people to support our marriages. We don't just rely on each other, we rely on other people. And I think Lila Rose brought that out extremely well. We need to be supporting each other, supporting each other's uh, marriages, uh, not only intergenerationally, but um, among friends and uh, co-congregants and uh, people in our community. Well, good. Uh, so now uh, we move to uh, Professor Will, William uh, Wilfred McClay. Bill, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you here very go. much. And uh, and Rabia, to, to, to uh, recur to your New York Yankees uh, example, I got to say that uh, this is uh, being fifth in the batting order uh, is a real privilege because you know There'll be runners on base with this team. Uh, so I have a chance to get an RBI or two out of this. Uh, so uh, thank you for having me. And it's wonderful to be with, with uh, the, these people, all of these wonderful people. Uh, one of the, my first reactions, the invitation to this was to think about the word itself, fidelity, and to acknowledge that it's something, it has a something somewhat antique quality in our usage. I'm not saying it should by any means. I just, I think it does. It sort of reminds me of the way that the word virtue used to be, you know, maybe around the 1960s, 70s, uh, which I, I actually can remember those times. <laughs> and and uh, virtue was, a, was a, a word for a kind of very straightened understanding of chastity and, and not much else. Well, that's changed. I think there, there's been, a, a, for all sorts of reasons, a renovation of the, the Greek understanding of arete, of the, that there are human excellences that ought to be sought after for the full, fullest flourishing of human life. So uh, I'd like to see something like that happen to fidelity, the word fidelity, for it to be given some of the fullness and amplitude of its of its meaning. Uh, we, we, we don't use it very much. When I when I, I, one of the first things I did, of course, was to go to the computer and look look up the word on the internet. And of course, the first 20 entries were about financial services, um, you know, fidelity investments. And, uh, the, you know, we make of that what you will. Uh, but it, it, it uh, I had to specify, I'm interested in the word, the definition of the word and so on to get anything out of the computer. Um, and that does say something about the how infrequently we use the word in in, in, uh, in a variety of instances. I think fidelity, in every instance in which it's used seriously, and maybe even the financial services example, involves a duty owed to others, a duty, an adherence to something larger than oneself, whether it's people, the family family unit, uh, one's, one's spouse, 
or a principle uh, that is larger than oneself and one's desires, one's appetites and so on, larger than our wills, larger than our wishes, larger than our principal concerns. And uh, I think what several of the speakers, this is where my batting fifth comes in handy, have uh, had wonderful things to say about this, about how, uh, uh, how these fidelity is an enlargement. It's not a diminishment of ourselves. It's an enlargement of ourselves, precisely because we, we give ourselves over to a larger meaning. Andrew Walker spoke of the ordering of the soul that comes of fidelity to, uh, the, to, to principles. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, Robbie talked about being, uh, being under judgment, under understanding of our political situation as being one where we have gifts, but we are under judgment as to how we make use of them. Uh, we're, we're not, to be under God is not to say that God is sort of out there in the cheering section for us and that we, we're, we're, we're bound to win. No, it's, it's an added duty. I won't say burden, it's an added duty that, 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 that comes with, with that, that status. So, so um, uh, and it may be, I, my assigned topic is the nation, fidelity to the nation, um, uh, which relates to patriotism, of course, but in some ways is, is bigger than that even. Um, and this is a hard, this is a hard one. I think um, it's it's easier. I think, and and with all due respect, I mean it's easier to make the case for uh, marriage than it is for the nation. I think at the moment, uh, uh, especially at the moment, uh, it, it's whatever side of the political spectrum one sides with and on. Uh, you you're going to see people who are very unhappy. With the current state of things, and have who have reason to be profoundly unhappy, and I'm not sure it's worth our time for me to spin out all the details. But uh, I think we all know them, and some we've heard some of them already. Um, and the unhappiness comes from something we're real that, that one can have a very distinct sense that our country is is. Uh, um, more restless than just the usual Augustinian dose that Andrew Walker referred to, that we are uh, in, in serious decline, that we have uh, you know, abandoned, that we have been faithless, uh, that we have not been showed fidelity to our fundamental principles and our fundamental commitments. Um, and it's also difficult to talk about the nation in these terms because you face the uh, real, if I think exaggerated, uh, uh, problem of, of phenomena like Christian nationalism, that is equating the state with uh, religion, with the will of God, with uh, uh, God's presence in the world and action in the world. Uh, I, as I say, I think it's exaggerated, but I don't think it's completely imaginary uh, that this is a, this is a, uh, a concern. Um, and yet there is one place that in, in our culture where I, I won't say it's used universally, but we do use the term fidelity and we recognize it. And I think most of us praise it. And that is in the slogan of the Marine Corps, Semper Fi, uh, sem, Semper Fidelis, of course, uh, but you know, in, in the usual American way, made into a kind of slogan, and which I find really wonderful and glorious, exhilarating. There's a, and, you know, the Marine Corps could have a slogan of, you know, meanest guys on the planet, or guys and women, I guess I should say, but uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, you know, too tough for anyone, I mean, whatever, you know, I, I can think of, of others. But Semper Fi is saying, you know, what's really special about this, we are always faithful. We are always faithful. We are always uh, on the mission. And that suggests a kind of uh, expression of uh, devotion to something larger than oneself, to a duty that is to an entity larger than oneself. And, and it's not a coincidence. The Marines, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not, not a Marine myself, I have no Marines in the family. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not a paid uh, <laughs> advertisement. 
But it's not a coincidence they advertise for the Marines. Some of the ads for years now have involved imagery of knights and of men being knighted uh, and of there being a, a becoming a Marine being a kind of induction into a chivalric order. Um, uh, it's, it's a symbolism that I think really matters. That in this corner of our culture, we still do have a sense of how fidelity to country, fidelity to the nation is a profoundly uh, um, uh, respectable and even virtuous attribute. Um, but uh, what about, uh, you say, uh, um, the, the, the people who adhere to the slogan of the Naval officer, Stephen Decatur, who famously said, you know, uh, uh, our country, I read the quote here, in her intercourse with foreign nations, may she always be in the right, but our country right or wrong. Uh, that's, one of the pathologies of fidelity to country, if it's fidelity to country that overrides fidelity to other concerns. You know, uh, uh, God and country is a nice slogan, but may maybe they aren't always in alignment with one another. And, and I like the corrective given to it by Carl Schurz, the, the German immigrant who was uh, an aide to Lincoln and eventually himself became a senator. Um, he said, my country right or wrong, if right to be kept right, and if wrong to be set right. So that in that case, fidelity to country is compatible with fidelity to higher values. You know, if, if you fight for, if the, in the struggle for life, uh, uh, for the protection of innocent human life, if you say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not moving to the North Pole. You know, I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm here, and, 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 and I'm here to make my country set right. Then it seems to me that's the right kind of balance. But to uh, but setting aside fidelity to your country is not something to be done lightly. That's not something to be done because you don't like uh, the complexion of the of a particular president or or of some passing thing. And it's not even something to be done because of profoundly unjust laws that, that laws that you think are profoundly unjust stay and work to mend them thank you very much uh professor mcclay uh now uh professor wilson hi thank you everybody um and thank you robbie for this invitation it's great to be with you all i want to um I want to share a few thoughts that really spin uh, right out of of Bill's uh, last sentences there, and that's to share a reflection on on a kind of fidelity that sort of falls between the stools of of God, country, and family, and that's a fidelity to our local places and especially the places of our birth. Uh, Andrew mentioned that as as saint augustine so famously expressed we're all intrinsically ordered we have a natural appetite for the absolute that is god and for life in him and that's something that can only be set aside at our peril because it is so deeply embedded in us and robbie mentioned at the outset that one of the great perversions of that desire for the absolute that haunted the 20th century was blood and soil nationalism when the love of country came to be a substitute for that absolute devotion we owe only to God. Because of that, of course, faithfulness to place has gained a bad reputation. And Bill just um, mentioned some of that at the very end of his comments with phrases like my country right or wrong. But I wanted to share a few thoughts in defense of these of fidelity to place and with, I think, a very good reason that's rooted among many things in, in Tocqueville's appreciation of early American society. When indeed we do ascend to the knowledge of God and recognize him as our creator and ourselves as creatures, we recognize that we're part of an order that is subordinate to him who is alone our sovereign, but also that we are part of an order, that we are creatures with natures, that we are finite creatures, that each have a place and a natural ordination 
to live our lives in a particular way. So I wanna make an appeal, not only for the fidelity that leads us to faithfulness to the one who has an absolute claim upon us, our God, but also for fidelity to the place we find ourselves in the natural created order and a place that was first given to us by God and not freely chosen by us as an act of our will. I've been thinking about this a great deal lately, first of all, because like many of you, I'm always thinking about Aristotle and how he uh, emphasizes that while human beings are rational animals, we're also among the political animals. We're intrinsically social. We're born into society. We would not be without society and we cannot flourish without society. Indeed, the polis, his conception of the properly ordered community, political community, is something that serves to help us to flourish, and we couldn't imagine flourishing without it, unless we were to become, as he puts it, cyclopses, which we are not. So if we need this natural ordination to life in community, if we are to flourish, why is it that the Wall Street Journal and so many other um, polls seem to indicate that people's attachments to their local communities have sunk uh, to abysmal levels. I'm reminded of Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone in America, where, as those of you who know the book will know, he points out that the average, you know, the average married man in the 1950s would have belonged to a bowling league, whereas the average man in the early 2000s, if he's bowling at all, is likely to be bowling alone. And of course, uh, at our time, he's more likely to be in a basement playing a video game. So we live in an age of, of withdrawal and loneliness and solitude. And this cannot but have immense consequences for us. Because it's, a, it's in fact a withdrawal that while driven by our appetites is actually uh, contrary to our nature as social beings, as political animals. I wanted to reflect therefore for just a minute on a distinction that a scholar I'm unlikely in most contexts to be found citing, Edward Said, uh, made many years ago. Said distinguished between filiation and affiliation. Filiation are all those associations we have with others that are given to us, that are natural, that we're born into. They include, of course, first and foremost, the family, but also the local community, the place where we are born. And then he describes affiliations. Affiliated of connections are those we in some sense choose, whether through our entrance into a school or joining of an organization. Even marriage itself is in a way an affiliative act, though it has its affiliative properties. When, we, when I define these two in this way, it might sound as if it's a matter of indifference, whether something is affiliative or affiliative, that one kind of association is the same or the equivalent of another. But in fact, I want to argue for the superiority of those filiative relationships that we have, and for a few reasons. They are, of course, given to us. They're not chosen, they, and, they can, and in consequence, they can often feel stifling or forced. But in fact, we also recognize that they're natural and that there's no substitute for them. Some of Anna's, the statistics she was citing earlier indicate how essential the given love of parents for a child are and how there's no full and complete substitute for that kind of relationship in the life of a child. So it is with all of our filiative connections, including the places into which we're born. The argument for, for their importance, however, is not simply that they're different than affiliations and not simply that they're not, uh, and that, they're, that they can't be replaced by affiliations, but rather that the many affiliations into which we will be we will submit ourselves or gather ourselves in the course of our life, these are made stronger if we have first strong rooted filiative connections. And so I'm not arguing for one kind of connection as good and the other as bad. I'm rather arguing for one as a root and the other as the branch. I, I think for instance of, um, of say a young woman going off to college for the first time. Can she really be, as it were, a good member of her university if she hates the place where she's from? I'm thinking also of the young man who, uh, who might be um, 
about to propose to a young woman? Is he likely to be a good husband and father if he's already um, burned and cynical about his relationships with his own family? Obviously, these are, are broad and heuristic pictures, but the fact is that our filiative, filiative relationships are formative of how of the affiliations we form later in our lives. But not that only. What I've just said suggests that affiliation is a kind of schoolhouse for affiliation, and, that's, and so it is. But also there's a quality to those societies that we belong to by nature that affiliative associations never quite have. I can offer one particular example, and it's highly personal. Just two years ago, I returned home to my native land of Michigan, just in time for the citizens of Michigan's to, Michigan to legalize marijuana and then inscribe abortion into our constitution. These have not been joyful events in my life or the life of my family. But because of our given love for the place we come from, we feel when these bad things happen, not a desire to cut and leave, not a desire for a divorce from our native state, but rather a desire for forbearance, patience, and to work that this good place can be made better by the overcoming of the evils that have, that have infected it. I think that these filiative connections, in other words, are, make possible a kind of fidelity that many of our other attachments just aren't capable of, and that if we ignore them or overlook them, we're robbing both ourselves of attachments that we genuinely need, but also we're robbing our, our country and our fellow citizens and those who know us of the kinds of faithfulness, of kinds of faithfulness that are especially strong and stable and that it cannot be substituted for, or, and that will accept no substitutes. So with that, I think I will leave off. Thank you very, very much, Professor Wilson. Those were really uh, rich remarks. And uh, if we had more time, I'd want to engage you on some of those, especially that uh, distinction that you borrowed from Edward Said about filiative versus affiliative uh, connections. Uh, I, I, I think one of the biggest challenges for liberal theory um, something I've wrestled with my entire life as a critic of liberalism my entire career, is trying to come up with a way to account for unchosen obligations, filiative, association-based obligations. And when liberal theorists try to do that, they always end up one way or another backing themselves into natural law thinking, that there are certain duties that do arise simply in virtue of our unchosen connections, our family, our nationality, uh, things like, like that. They're natural duties. They are not chosen uh, duties. But that's a conversation that uh, we should find an opportunity at some point to continue. Uh, and now batting cleanup, uh, my beloved friend, uh, Yuval Levin. Yuval? Well, thank you very much, Ravi. I really appreciate being part of this group and part of this effort. Uh, I like to be part of any group where you can say with that irony that, like all of you, I'm always thinking about Aristotle, which is really true. <laughs> um, I, 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 I think batting cleanup in a group like this means that a lot of the truth has been illuminated and a lot of what there is to say has been said. And let me emphasize a few points that might be connected in ways that will shed just a little bit more light on fidelity. Uh, as a number of uh, previous speakers have said in several ways, fidelity implies commitment and attachment, obligation. It's in that sense profoundly countercultural right now in a time when people tend to think about freedom only in terms of choice. We're proposing a way here to think about freedom in terms of obligation and commitment. And the reason for that is that we think freedom is not something that you get by breaking, but by building. It's not something that we have when we are liberated from the constraints of others, but when we're formed to become what we are intended to be precisely by our attachment to others. And that formation really happens through the core institutions of our society, the ones we've been hearing about. It's enabled by family and religion and community and country, enabled by our fidelity to them. We're liberated by coming to play a part in each of these, by taking on our proper role in life, which are roles within the lives of families and communities 
churches and synagogues, ultimately society. And part of what it means to take on that role is to identify our fate with theirs, our ambitions with theirs, our happiness and our fulfillment with those institutions that help to shape us. Um, I, I'm Jewish, and I have to say, Robbie, that my first reaction to your idea for Fidelity Month was a very Jewish reaction, which is to say June is perfect because June aligns with the, with the Jewish month of Sivan, which is the month when we read the book of Ruth. Um, just this past Saturday in my synagogue and in every synagogue around the world, we read aloud the book of Ruth. And Ruth is in many ways a book about fidelity. Um, it is at the heart of it, a, a, a kind of extraordinary statement of fidelity when in a moment of crisis, Ruth is given the choice to leave behind her mother-in-law, Naomi, and pursue her own path, her own freedom in those terms. She chooses instead to remain loyal. And she says something really extraordinary that is the very heart of that book, in Ruth 116, she says, don't urge me to leave you and turn my back on you. We're bound together. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. That is a statement of fidelity. It's the kind of statement that we all make where our love is really greatest in life, where we, the, the sort of statement we make to our family, to our closest friends, to our religious community, uh, to the things we really love and believe in, we say, your fate is my fate. Your love is my love. Your life is my life. It's a statement of openness to being formed by obligation and by commitment. And that kind of fidelity really requires a willingness to invest ourselves in the institutions that embody it, in the family or the church or the school, the community, the nation, in those institutions to which we're committed, not as abstract ideas, but as concrete realities, as groups of people who matter to us and who ultimately embody what it is that we hold together. The willingness to be formed by these kinds of institutions requires of us, I think, also a willingness to build and to preserve and to reinforce those institutions to which we're faithful. It provides us with a kind of picture of what we love in life that stands also as a blueprint of what we need to build and rebuild and sustain and invest ourselves in. I think that is particularly important right now. We live in a time in America when everyone is much too much in the habit of talking only about what they hate. We can't change the subject from what makes us angry. And certainly some of that anger is rooted in commitment and in fidelity. We're angry at people who threaten our communities, who threaten our ways of life, who we're angry at people who want to turn the country away from its traditional commitments and from fidelity. But anger at them is not going to persuade the rising generation of Americans to turn away from the vision that they're being offered by people who threaten our institutions. We'll persuade those younger Americans, we'll persuade everybody who's open-minded and looking for the right path, as so many Americans are, not by talking about what we hate, but by talking about what we love. And in a sense, the two serve the same purpose. We love our families and we hate those who would denigrate or undermine them. We love our religious communities. We hate those who threaten them and their capacity to live by the truth. But the emphasis on love really does matter. Part of what it means to talk about fidelity and part of how fidelity can help the rising generation to find its way is that it moves us to emphasize and to articulate, to say what we love in the world. Every time that you're inclined to speak with anger about what you hate in this moment in America, and it happens to all of us all the time, we should try to turn that around and speak with joy about what we love. And you'll be talking about the same subject most of the time, but doing it in a way that invites people who are confused by this moment in the life of our country, as so many good Americans are, to come with you and to love what you love, to join you in your commitments, ultimately to discover the renewing, liberating power of fidelity. I think helping people see what there is to love is a way to invite them to change. Helping people see what there is to hate is off-putting. If they don't already agree with you, maybe they don't end up on the other side, but they just say, well, that guy is not where I'm headed. But to help people see what you're committed to and why and how that commitment is ultimately liberating, how it gives you a role can be just enormously powerful in a moment when so many Americans feel lonely, isolated, alienated. I think that, that, that idea of a role that a number of previous speakers have talked about, the notion that when you're confronted with a difficult choice, you can ask yourself, what's my role here? What do I owe these people? 
rather than just asking, what do I want? Or how do I want to be seen? Fidelity allows you to answer a difficult question in a difficult moment of decision by thinking about your obligations. It gives you a way to understand what's called for, what's asked of you, that can be enormously liberating and empowering. I think that is really exactly what Robbie has invited us to do here. And I'm just very grateful for the invitation, very glad to have accepted it, and glad to be here at the beginning of what I hope is a real movement. So thank you, Robbie. Oh, thank you, Yuval. That was so beautiful. Uh, and I want to emphasize that Fidelity Month is all about love, and it's all about joy. Uh, it does not mistake sentimentality for love. It's not about sentimentality. It's about love, the real thing, the active thing, the thing that, that moves us to act for the sake of others, for the sake of our families, for the sake of our friends, for the sake of our communities, for the sake of our country, for the sake of our, our world. And joy uh, isn't, doesn't mean that uh, we're happy with the way everything is and there's nothing to do and nothing to improve. No, uh, the joy that we stand for is a joy that understands that the world is worth making better, that, the, that, that wrongs really are worth righting. Things really matter. We care about things. So we take our joy in the struggle, the opportunity, to make things uh, better. Well, thanks to all our panelists. You've uh, certainly uh, vindicated my claim that we have the intellectual equivalent of the 27 uh, Yankees here. And now it's time to move into some uh, questions. Since we don't have a great deal of time left uh, in the webinar, I'll um, uh, try to be brief myself in any uh, responses I make to questions, and I'll ask the panelists to do likewise. Uh, the first uh, question that jumps out from the list that I have been given is an important one. It's a threshold question, and I think we, we should answer it. Do you envision Fidelity Month as a way to engage modernity and American culture anew, quote, recommitting itself to missionary discipleship and permanent evangelization, a la George Weigel? Or would you envisage Fidelity Month as, quote, an exile from the mainstream culture and construct a, resi a resilient counterculture? Uh, a la Rod uh, Dreher, I think in his uh, uh, famous uh, book about the Benedict uh, option. Well, on this, I can be clear and I can be brief. While I think it's very, very important for us to build strong sub-communities, our religious communities, our families, our local communities, our, our civic associations, our neighborhood associations, um, our charities, it's very important uh, to have those little platoons uh, flourishing. This is not a movement of retreat, quite the opposite. It is a movement for the renewal of the culture. We strengthen ourselves and our local communities and our small communities so that we can go out there and make a difference in the larger culture, restoring it to its fundamental values of faith in God, faithful marriages and families, uh, service to our community, uh, love, of, love of country. Um, here I'm, I'm reminded of the great hymn uh, that uh, that our forefathers uh, sang uh, when the when the nation was in its greatest peril in the Civil War, the great battle hymn of the Republic. That verse that says, "He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. No retreat." we move forward. This is a movement for cultural renewal. Um, the next question is for uh, Dr. Samuel. Uh, Anna, uh, the questioner asks, what would you say to a young person who is so obsessed with climate change that they see marriage as pointless and having children as merely causing more carbon uh, production? You know, one does, hear, teaching uh, young men and women, I do run into that and I'm, I'm quite puzzled by it. What would you say about it, Anna? Well, I would probably capitalize on their care or their concern for others and say, you know, we're, we're starting to suffer the threat of underpopulation now yeah. um, and really show them some good statistics on them. Look, point to Japan, point to other places that are facing infertility writ large and, and start us. I wouldn't disagree with them necessarily on climate change. I would just say there's other aspects of our moral ecology to use a term coined by somebody we know well, um, that we also need to try to preserve, right? Um, because the data is pretty strong there too, right? It's not overpopulation that we're facing. You know, Anna, I am old enough to remember when a man named Paul Ehrlich, who was a celebrated scientist, I believe he taught at Stanford, you all can correct me if I have that wrong, 
uh, predicted famously and to great acclaim uh, that there would be a, a population explosion that would cause massive food uh, shortages and uh, cause a death by starvation and famine to hundreds of millions or even billions of people by the 1980s. And there were, uh, everyone believed that. I mean, all the, all the intelligent people, all the highly educated people, I mean, it became the orthodoxy of the cultural elite. And of course, it was as wrong as it could possibly be. And there were just a few uh, thoughtful souls, uh, the great Julian Simon, an economist at the University of Maryland, who saw through it immediately. And uh, he actually made a bet with uh, Professor Ehrlich about whether food prices would would rise or fall. Of course, if, if Ehrlich was right, food prices would prices would rapidly rise. In fact, they went in the other direction and fell. Uh, but uh, very few people, at least in the elite culture and the great universities and so forth, uh, had the had the vision to see that he was completely wrong. Um, every generation has its doomsayers. Doomsayers. You know, the world is going to uh, come to an end. But Anna's absolutely right. Of of course, uh, if you look at the situation globally, our problem is not overpopulation. Our problem is actually underpopulation. This does not mean we should, should not care about the environment. We should. We want healthy, clean air and healthy water for uh, for everybody. Uh, we, we should try to reduce pollution, obviously. There are very, very good reasons for doing that. But no, the world's not coming uh, to an end, and, and uh, the world can afford, in fact, it would benefit from your marrying and having uh, children. Uh, we have some questions about concrete ways to move from the conversation about Fidelity Month to civic action. So I'm gonna throw this out to the group as a whole uh, for what ideas you have about moving forward. Now, uh, I'll, I'll open by saying, if you want a great list of ideas, read Yuval Levin's superb book, A Time to Build a time to build. It's all about the building that we need to do it. I'm proud to say it began as a series of lectures in the James Madison program in American Ideals and Institutions at, at Princeton, but it's 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 out there to read and I, I commend it to your attention. But any of our panelists, uh, Yuval, for example, have ideas uh, off the top of your head about um, how to respond to the question of what people can do concretely in their communities. Well, maybe I would start very briefly, Ravi. I, I think it's important for us to understand that a lot of the problems people confront now are problems of dissolution, of alienation, of, of loneliness and isolation. And in some ways, the place to begin to draw people into fidelity is to offer them ways of being engaged in active ways in advancing what they believe in. Building, rather than standing around with arms folded saying, isn't somebody from the government going to come and fix this? Think about the problems you confront in your, in your own local community. Think about your neighbors and their distinct strengths and look for ways to build. This is actually a very American trait. Uh, you know, Tocqueville jokes that you get three Americans together and they elect a treasurer. Mm -hmm. And I think there is still some of that in our, in our bones as Americans. Um, and to me, the core of the answer to the question that's asked here is to think from the bottom up, to think in the first person plural in terms of us and we and our about problems that we face and ask ourselves how the solutions can also be first person plural solutions. What can I do? The answer is not nothing. Any other panelists have uh, thoughts here? I mean, my, my, this idea might sound a little outlandish, but I've often wondered if maybe a national fast might not be an interesting option. Um, you know, since ancient times, Jews and Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus have all turned to fasting as something that unites them and helps them. I mean, it confers great spiritual benefits as well as psychological benefits. And yeah. during the month when there's a lot of debauchery, you know, when we can do the opposite, you know, we could we could deny ourselves in some small ways to be more faithful, a kind of fidelity fast, I think might unite all races and religions as well. What a good idea, Anna, that's a great idea. Uh, let me add that one thing we can all do is set examples to others of fidelity, set an example of fidelity to others. Uh, the way we lead our, our lives, our, our own love of God, our own uh, love and care for our spouses and our families, uh, our own service to our communities, our own love of country. If we do that unashamedly, if we do that openly, uh, if we're willing to uh, express uh, these values that we believe in in the public forum, not not ramming them down people's throats or haranguing people or anything like that, but allowing ourselves to be seen 
affirming what we truly believe in. I think that sets a good example for our neighbors and friends, and certainly for the nation's young people, starting with our own children, but the nation's young people more generally. People need heroes and they need role models. And I think we can all do our part in uh, providing those. Uh, secondly, one way of bearing witness is with symbolism. Symbolism is important. There's no such thing as mere symbolic or mere symbolism. Symbolism is really important. I'd really encourage everybody to use the fidelity symbol, the logo created by our friend Deacon John uh, Barry. It's a, it's a beautiful logo. Um, you, you use it on your social media. Uh, make a flag. You can buy, if you go to the website, uh, the Fidelity Month website, fidelitymonth.com, if you go to the website, uh, you can uh, find a place there where you can purchase hats and shirts and things like that with the Fidelity logo. We don't make any money on those at all. It's all at cost. We're, we're, not, we're not fundraising with, uh, with our merch, uh, but we just want to make these available at the lowest possible cost to people so that they can go out and take advantage of the power of symbol. Take advantage of the power of symbolism to send a message and to inspire other people. Um, Can I add two quick things, Robbie? Yeah, Andrew, please. Yeah, I, I mean, really, the simplest way, and you mentioned symbols, is um, I noticed that not a lot of people fly the American flag in neighborhoods. So we decided to put up an American flag on our house, and uh, that's something that I take particular pride in. And then I think another practical thing to consider is, you know, one of the areas that I'm most encouraged by it, with the growth of civic engagement is the growth of kind of classical education nationally. These schools run on shoestring budgets. Uh, they're aimed at recapturing the next generation in the Western tradition. They need help uh, as far as scholarships, assistance. Um, they need parental involvement. And so I think it's an all hands on deck operation. And so that's a really practical way just to be looking for what are the what are the schools in your area that you possibly could send your own kids to uh, or that you could help volunteer and help strengthen. Here's a question that uh, I'll bet is on the minds of a great many people in our um, rather strained political circumstances today. A questioner asks, how can we be faithful to our country if the government cannot be trusted? The people in this country, it seems, are not responsible. The government is just trying to consolidate and maintain its power. How can we be faithful to a political order like this? Bill McClay, let me turn to you. Um, people are experiencing the government is very hostile to them. Uh, people are upset with their, their neighbors uh, and, and, and with some of the irresponsible behavior that you know, produces political results like some of the ones we're, we're seeing. And so that frustration is, is coming out here in this question, which, as I say, I'll bet is shared by a great many people today. Bill, what do you say? Yeah, I, 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 I think it is shared by a great many people, including myself at times. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I think James Wilson's, James Matthew Wilson's uh, comments are very germane here, that there is a way in which people uh, can get caught up in abstractions, can get caught up in things that they read on the internet that may or may not have any kind of grounding in reality or maybe, um, I, I mean, I, I mean, we've all had moments like this. I remember a moment when I was teaching at the University of Oklahoma and somebody uh, started getting deluged with emails from people about the protests going on on my campus. Um, I had no idea there were any, and, they, and, and, and I had to look around and finally find in front of the engineering building, there were three or four people walking in a picket line, and but this is all going on on CNN and so on. And, and uh, we, we really have to be, uh, the, the, part of what James was saying is that we have to attend to what is close at hand, the things that we can touch, to the ground that we walk on, to the people that we know, to the face and face-to-face, um, the transactions that we have, those help to ground us better in the, now, now that doesn't mean that large things such as the things that made him uh, feel a sense of regret in moving back to Michigan, and I live in Michigan too, and uh, recently moved here, and I'm kind of at times wondering uh, whether we'll ever have another fair election, but um, it, it is really in, we don't live in a regime that is any more tyrannical than any other has been, uh, it may be in a different way uh, or corrupted in a different way. Um, 
And uh, I think the answer is always the same, is that you, you, you attend to the things that, you, that are within your power to attend to. And try not to get caught up, and this Yuval, I think, pointed this out too, not try to get taught, caught up in abstractions. Try to think in terms of what is, what is immediate, the things that you know, um, to, to trust. In a sense, we have to trust ourselves again. We have to trust our own senses, our own sensibilities. Uh, and not rely on the testimony of experts, which may mislead us. That's one of the things. I oh, yes, yeah, so, certainly true. I mean, experts have misled us for an awfully long yeah. time. Now, that doesn't mean that every expert is always wrong about everything. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, yes. Uh, you know, we were misled by experts. Our country was misled by experts into embracing eugenics. People don't like to think about that. But that was that was the knowledge class that led us into that. Absolutely. Uh, and and so many, uh, so many others. So, you know, we need to think. We actually need to think for ourselves. Um, let, let me stress that all the great reform movements, uh, the ones we're proud of in American history, abolition, uh, the reform movement to, to uh, protect women and children uh, in the labor force, uh, the civil rights movement under Dr. Martin Luther King and so forth, they've always benefited by active citizenship, an active citizenry. We need to be involved. We need to act on our responsibilities as citizens. You know, don't just complain about candidates, run for something yourself or find a candidate you can believe in and become part of that campaign. Certainly make financial contributions to causes and campaigns that you uh, you you believe in. Participate in citizens uh, forums. Um, citizenship is not just voting on Election Day, though, though you certainly need to do that. We need to be voters. We need to be active citizens at the polls. But that's not that doesn't exhaust. Voting does not exhaust our responsibilities as as citizens. So we need to be involved uh, there. And in our political involvement, let me stress the importance of constantly going back to, repairing to, being faithful to first principles. First principles, the principles of the Constitution, the principles of the Declaration of Independence. When we're assessing candidates, let's assess them based on their genuine fidelity to those basic principles and to the principles that we're lifting up today, to God and family, to community and, and country. Um, if I could add a couple of practices. Yes, Lila, please. It's such a great conversation. Uh, a few things just in terms of what, you know, what does this month look like in, in, in our everyday? I think invite in, invitation. So inviting people into one's homes, especially those that are, you know, single parents or those that are young singles or those that are young married, but that culture, you're, especially if you're in a, a strong marriage to uh, share that, invite people into your home, um, fostering and adopting. And sometimes that looks like a formal fostering and adopting order and going out of your way to support that family and be there for that family. Um, showing up on the sidewalks of abortion clinics to pray, pray peacefully um, is a tremendous uh, good and a tremendous example um, and, of fidelity and, and love for, for those that need it the most. Um, some other things too would be, um, you know, being there for your neighbor, find out who your neighbors are, who, who's in your apartment complex, who's in your neighborhood, do you know the names of your neighbors, would you invite them into your homes? Um, and then a little more on the activistic side, I do think um, strategic boycotts are valuable, you know, Target has lost $12 million in market cap um, capture right now, uh, capital with their um, their you know pride collection as they call it, um, which I think is a misnomer, but they you know use this term positively, and that's the power of people just saying I'm not shopping there anymore. Um, so don't pay, patronize places or companies that are incredibly hostile to fidelity and to our values, and be willing to speak about it openly. I do think the willingness to invite, the willingness to speak out. Um, it you know takes courage sometimes and putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions, but that courage is an example to others and it will inspire others to say, oh, it's not it's not so bad after all. There's more of us than maybe we realize. So being willing to kind of speak up and and go out of your way to invite people and and share your family life with others, I think are all concrete things that make a big difference. Excellent points, Lila. Well, uh, alas, uh, we've run out of time and we have to close our uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, uh, panelists, and thank you, friends who have zoomed in for helping us to launch Fidelity uh, Month in a, in a great way with a conversation about the most important values, the values that we're lifting up and trying to restore and renew uh, in Fidelity Month. 
Uh, perhaps I could close on, on this point. In this pluralistic democracy that we're blessed to call our country, uh, this republic, our, our founders preferred the term republic to democracy, in this, in this democratic republic, there will be people, there are people, many people, perhaps half of our fellow citizens, perhaps more, who disagree with us. But they are our fellow citizens. And fidelity also involves engaging in a civil, truth-seeking, respectful, honorable manner with those who disagree. If you spend all your time talking with people who agree with you, you're not going to get very far. You're not going to transform very many hearts, and you're not going to learn anything. So it's important to reach out to people who see things differently and to engage them in a respectful manner, honoring their humanity, their rationality. Who knows? We're all wrong about some things. We could be wrong about some important things. So we need to engage others in a truth-seeking spirit. Yes, standing up for our values, being people of conviction, but being open enough to, to listen, to consider that, that maybe you know, we could use some correction uh, too. I think if we engage our fellow citizens in that spirit, only good can come of it. And I think that's part of what it means to be faithful. So let me uh, uh, send everyone off uh, now uh, with, uh, if I may, one more exhortation. Let us all, by the way we conduct our own lives as citizens, as members of uh, uh, religious communities and other as associations, as members of local communities, uh, let us model the fidelity to God, the fidelity to family and marriage, the fidelity to, to country and community that we are trying to advance in uh, Fidelity Month. People do learn by precept, and it's important to talk. It's important to say the words. It's important to speak up for these values. But it's even more important to live them out because people learn more by example. I can tell you as someone who's taught for 38 years in the university context, students, but I think all people learn more by example than precept. Can't do away with the precept. You have to, you have to teach, you have to use words, but example is if anything, even more important. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, thanks to all who zoomed in to help us launch uh, Fidelity Month and God bless you all. Bye-bye now. Bye everyone.